Hello and welcome to the London Academy of Media, Film and Television. And welcome also to the online masterclass in television presentation. I'm your online tutor, Peter Purvis, and any background information you require about me can be found on my website, www.peterpurvis.net. I hope you enjoy and benefit from this course. Television has evolved from a very primitive means of communication into what it currently is in a comparatively short space of time. In the beginning, the first television picture in the world was transmitted from the downstairs to the upstairs in this building in Frith Street, Soho, London. Its inventor was a Scotsman, John Logie Baird, who proved that it was a technically feasible proposition. And although his method of transmission was never used in the early days of television, Baird's vision was the inspiration for what has become the most popular means of communication and entertainment in the modern world. Bianchi's, the Italian restaurant that used this building in the 50s till the 80s, called its upstairs room the bedroom. And many a secretary booking tables for clients would ask for a table in the bedroom, causing a certain amount of amusement. It wasn't until after the Second World War that television began to get into the consciousness of the population, both in the UK and in the USA. The UK used a line scanning system called PAL, which scanned an image on 405 lines 25 times every second. Those 405 lines made up the image on the receiver. In the USA, the NTSC system scanned pictures on 525 lines. The American system was slightly better in definition than the UK, and coloured images of a sort were able to be transmitted there. At that time, there was a very limited method of recording the images for later transmission. It was called telecine, and the television pictures were recorded on film and retransmitted via a telecine machine. Consequently, in the early days of television and up until the early 1960s, the majority of television programmes were performed live. And I mean everything. Drama, news, current affairs, the lot. Now, I'm sure you can imagine how difficult that was. It was a very demanding and difficult task to direct a play on television when every single shot, both its framing and its size, had to be written into the script, so that all of the technical people could read what they were going to have to reproduce. The actual operation of the control gallery in the studio was such a technical masterpiece, and the director was king. A vision mixer would sit next to the director, cutting up the pictures as indicated in the script. There would be technical managers who were responsible for the camera picture quality and the sound and lighting. And then there would be the production secretary who kept the timings and everyone in the studio up to date with where we would be in the script, what shot number we were on and what was coming up next. That was a vitally important role. On the studio floor, six to eight cameras would be deployed, each connected via a cable to a different point in the studio wall and operated by a single cameraman. Occasionally, studio cranes like the Mole Richardson were also used and requiring three operators and a cable tracker. Two or three large sound booms were in operation as the only means of getting the live sound from the various sets. The actors and the sets and furnishings were also a further complication in the overall jigsaw that ultimately would be a smooth and polished, even if somewhat limited, production. That is the background from which modern television has evolved. With the change in the UK to 625 line scanning in the late 1960s, good quality colour pictures could at last be transmitted in the UK. Tape recording, not domestic recorders, had become the means of storing programmes in the late 1950s, but the bulky cassettes containing the two inch wide tapes required too much space to store, and editing was a complicated and expensive operation. Some UK programmes in those early days, like Doctor Who for example, only had a budget, in some cases, for three edits per programme and many shows from that period were wiped by the BBC so that the tapes could be used again, an alarming piece of short-sighted vandalism. I appeared in 44 episodes of Doctor Who in 1965 and 6. Only 17 of those episodes remain, all the others were wiped. And that was the fate of so many programmes from the early days, amongst them Peter Cook and Dudley Moore's Not Only But Also, Alan Bennett's On The Margin, and hundreds of others. 
But when one inch C format tapes came along, storage became easier and editing was greatly simplified and reduced in cost. And from then on, the technical advancements came along at a remarkable rate. Domestic video recorders were developed by JVC Panasonic and Sony, and after a bloodless battle, the JVC Panasonic VHS system was adopted as the industry standard rather than Sony's Betamax system. By all accounts, the poorer system was the one adopted. Then came the launch of satellite television and the proliferation of channels and the change from the line system of transmission to the digital pixel-based format. And television hasn't stopped getting more and more sophisticated. Equipment began to shrink dramatically so that almost anyone can now make television programs of a reasonable quality, but not necessarily very well. This course is aimed at bringing out the best in you as a presenter, in a medium that needs to be treated with respect. Making good television is not easy. Technically, it may be simple, but the basic rules haven't changed much since broadcasting began.